Yes, good morning everybody. Um, so um, I'd like to make an observation to start with, which I don't think um, is particularly controversial, although I do think it is an important observation to make, which is the contribution to of electronic nicotine delivery systems to reduce the smoking-related harm will, in all probability, hang on two things. One is the relative toxicity of the products and the relative harm, um, not only in clinical settings, but actually more importantly in real world settings. And the other is the concern with gateway. Now, for many people, including the media, gateway is at least as important as relative toxicity and in many ways more important. I think it's fair to say that the ratchet of regulation, which is almost always up and very rarely down, will be influenced to a large extent by this issue of gateway. The extent to which these products are indicating an increased likelihood of people smoking, whether that's <coughs> smokers returning to smoking, or young people who haven't smoked, starting to smoke. And there is nobody who works in this field can have missed the very florid media coverage of recent research suggesting a significant gateway effect. Um, now, I'm going to talk about that in relation to interviews which myself and colleagues have carried out at the Centre of Substance Use Research looking particularly at young people's views of vaping. Um, but just very briefly, that's a list of the kind of research which we are carrying out. So we're looking at factors associated with initiation, uh, maintenance and cessation of e-cigarettes. We have a very large survey of e-cigarette e users across Europe, a very large survey in the US, um, which my colleague Dr. Christopher Russell will talk about. We have uh, work underway um, and some planned for later this year on vapors helping smokers with Dr. Mitch Knights. We have work underway looking at e-cigarettes and gateway and the claimed renormalization effect. And we're looking at issues to do with policy. Um, now, the work that I'm going to talk about today is the first of those, e-cigarettes and the reported gateway effect. And that's involved interviews with 120 people aged 16 to 28. The average age is 21. Uh, many of them aged 16, 17 or so. But we're also looking at non-smokers and non-vapers' views of smoking to really understand whether or not the availability and the public visibility of vaping is changing people's <laughs> perception of smoking, because that, at heart, is the claim about renormalization. Um, now, the gateway effect is fundamental in addiction science. It's one of the most influential, but most contested concepts. Um, it's, it's controversial because it's not clear whether it's a description or a causal explanation. If it's a causal explanation, of gateway progression from one substance to another, it's not clear whether the mechanism there is to do with the drug, uh, whether it's the person, whether it's the environment within which the drug is being used. Um, we don't know what drug should be classified as a gateway substance. Some people have suggested it's alcohol, some people have suggested it's tobacco, and many people uh, in the United States have suggested it's marijuana. But what one determines by way of whether or not there is a gateway effect, particularly in relation to young people's progression from one substance to another, in this case from initial use of e-cigarettes to, to combustibles, that issue, not well understood at the moment, inadequately understood at the moment, is unquestionably going to influence regulation. Um, so that's the study which all of you, I'm sure, will know, which comes up with the statement that e-cigarette use in adolescence and a pre-e-cigarette social environment 
may put adolescents at risk for future use of cigarettes. E-cigarettes may contribute to subsequent cigarette use via nicotine addiction of, or social normalization of smoking behavior. So at its simplest, that is potentially a catastrophic proposition. The result or, or the likely consequences of which is very, very tight regulation of e-cigarettes to a degree that may add impact negatively on the capacity to reduce uh, smoking-related harm. Now, that is a slide which will be met familiar with to many of you, but not necessarily all of you, which is a scale of relative harm of different products, um, ranging on the right to the least harmful, where one, I, I've actually put e-cigarettes down that end, and the most harmful substance is here. Now, the gateway proposition is that users of the softer drugs at the right-hand end progress to the left to the left-hand end. That, in essence, is the gateway effect. But we don't know what's driving that. But the, the evidence for a gateway effect in relation to marijuana is the incontrovertible observation that most people using heroin have previously used marijuana. That, in essence, is why the gateway theory has attained a level of, of, of plausibility. But the troubling parallel observation to that fact is the observation that most people who use marijuana don't use heroin. So there is nothing inevitable about the progression from one drug to another, from marijuana to heroin. The judgment on a marijuana user as to whether they also use heroin is likely to be complex, it's likely to be partly genetic, individual, environmental, attitudinal, and to do with the availability of, of all these alternative drugs. Now, each of those areas are nebulous around human behavior. They're nebulous judgments which individuals make. So an individual makes a judgment. I may use, her um, I may use marijuana, but will I use heroin? That is not, there is no necessity about the, 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 the assent to that proposition. I do use marijuana, and I may use heroin. That is a judgment which individuals make. And they make it, in all, most probability, on a complex range of factors to do with how they perceive these different substances. So heroin is seen as a very much more dangerous drug than marijuana. So a marijuana user may say, I don't want to use the more dangerous drug, even though that drug is available to me. Which raises a question to do with e-cigarettes and smoking. To do with what do users of e-cigarettes, how do they perceive the relative harm, the reasons for initiating, the similarity or dissimilarity between smoking and vaping. Those are judgments which collectively, you might say, are to do with social distance. How distant is vaping <coughs> to smoking? Now, the gateway proposition would say it is quite similar in certain respects, and it may be quite similar in relation to nicotine, to explain the claimed gateway effect. But is that the view of vapors themselves? And this is where I draw on the interviews with young people. So why do young people actually even use e-cigarettes in the first place? Now, predominantly, the reasons we have found on the research which we have undertaken, um, which I should say is funded by Fontaine Ventures, is that curiosity and the novelty of the product and the visibility of vaping are predominantly the reasons why young people say they're attracted to vaping. Just because someone I knew had one, and I was curious, to be honest, because I'd seen other people in, with them, and then I just thought I'd give it a shot. It was a one-off thing purely out of curiosity. And curiosity was the most common term that in, young people used when they were describing their, their initial use, probably out of curiosity more than anything. Can you say what first attracted you? Just because I thought the vapor looked cool, and to be honest, I could do it inside. So the, 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 the ability to vape inside was cited by this individual as a reason for... For, for his use. But it's also evident from what the young people said that they were really attracted to the visible display of the vapor plume. You can do tricks and stuff, and maybe because it's a new thing as well, it surprises them with the, the massive clouds. So th this doesn't sound like the sorts of observations which anyone would make about the initiation of smoking. This is about visible display, curiosity, and interest in a new product. So, when, when, as I make these observations, I think things to bear in mind how close are these observations to smoking? 
Because if they're not close, that conveys something of the order of the social distance between vaping and smoking, which is likely to be important in the judgments young people make as to whether to progress or transition from one to the other. Nicotine. Now, nicotine, in this instance, has been proposed as the mechanism through which a gateway effect may be occurring. There is no, there is no analogue in relation to explaining the progression from marijuana to heroin. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing in essence similar about those two drugs that could offer a mechanism within the drug itself. In relation to nicotine, the proposition is that nicotine may be the mechanism through which <coughs> the, the gateway effect is being driven. But actually, when you interview young people, nicotine isn't the drug that they're, in, they're actually greatly interested in. It's been more like fun whenever I use them for, rather than actual nicotine. In my experience, people use them with very low levels of nicotine or, or there is no nicotine in them. It was the strong nicotine one, but now it's the mild one. I've eased myself off the strong one. So this is an older vapor talking about using e-cigarettes to actually reduce their nicotine exposure and actually expressing a degree of incredulity that anybody would be interested in a, in, in a non nicotine based product. But this is an interesting comment from a young person. I feel bad when I have a cigarette now. Now that's an interesting observation. So now this, now this young person feels different about smoking than they did previously. I feel unhealthy. I feel I'm putting chemicals and cancer and stuff in my body. Whereas like before, I didn't really care. It just made me feel more aware of it. Are you, are you saying that it has changed how you see smoking? Yeah, because when we did smoke before, we didn't really care much. But now, I wouldn't smoke anymore because I can just do that. Vape now. Do you think that you are further away from the possibility of smoking now? Yeah, miles. What would happen if you couldn't vape? I probably smoke, to be honest. So here's a young person saying that the that 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 their vaping activity has moved them substantially away from smoking. Now that's important because those are the judgments out of which a gateway effect either is or is not going to occur. Perceptions of harm. Now the young people we interviewed invariably cited the greater harm which they understood to be associated with combustibles, even if they narrowed the, the, the distinction between the two. It was not evident that 95% less harm has, has penetrated through to the, the, the level of understanding amongst young people, and I think that's a significant finding in itself. It's less harmful than smoking because it's not got the same toxins and fumes and tar in it. So that view has, has clearly got through. I wouldn't say it was as harmful as cigarettes. I would say that smoking cigarettes is really bad in that people around can get affected. Vaping wouldn't affect others as much because it isn't as harmful as smoking. So that view certainly is, is entrenched. But then how similar is, are these two activities? I just don't think they're very similar at all. They don't taste the same, they don't smell the same, the action of doing one is, isn't the same, but it's not perceived as the same. It's not perceived as unhealthy as smoking. I don't know, I don't think people would care if you vaped around their kids, if you smoked around their kids. I think they would have something to say about that. We asked them if they thought vaping had made smoking more popular. Do you think vaping has made smoking more acceptable or less acceptable? The overwhelming view amongst the young people we interviewed was that it had made smoking less acceptable. In fact, many people expressed a degree of incredulity now that anybody would smoke, given that there is an alternative um, now available. I think less acceptable, if anything, because there's an alternative now to smoking cigarettes. So that in the way I think maybe the opposite, the opposite of having made it more attractive. So what would one say here? The young people we were interviewing saw vaping and smoking as being associated with very different harms. They understood the, nat the, the nature of that difference, even if they f hadn't fully appreciated the magnitude of the difference. So when we mentioned the 95% figure, many of the young people were frankly surprised that the order of difference was that great, even though they recognised that one was substantially more harmful than the other. While some were focused on nicotines, others were certainly not. They were more focused on flavour and plumes. The predominant view was that vaping had made smoking less likely, not more likely, and it had not, for the most part, renormalised smoking. 
So there was no indication in any of our interviews with young people that smoking itself had become more socially acceptable as a result of theirs and others' visible vaping than had, would otherwise have been the case. They consistently described smoking as extraordinarily harmful. Now that raises, in policy terms, a, a very stark issue, which is how to deliver the benefits associated with electronic nicotine delivery systems in reducing smoking-related harms without actually diluting those benefits and increasing smoking-related harms. And that is undoubtedly challenging policymakers at the moment and is at the heart of the regulatory uh, dispute that's occurring at the moment. To what extent are the regulations that are in the process of being implemented, are they sufficiently well designed to enable the maximum beneficial effect of e-cigarettes and other electronic nicotine systems to be realised without dampening down that effect and by implication allowing to increase or not allow to further decrease the smoking related health harm. And we are certainly in a domain where evidence is important, and that evidence needs to be elicited, not simply in the laboratory, but actually in real-world situations of use. As Lynn's research shows, how people actually smoke or how people use electronic uh, nicotine delivery systems may actually hold a greater clue to the degree to which these systems can reduce harm than the measured reductions in toxicity found in a laboratory, especially if there's compensatory activity taking place. But the challenge is to make the most of this technology, but actually not to dampen it down to such a degree that well-known smoking-related harms increase. And the related issue in relation to prevention... You need to finish. Okay. The related in, in, in relation to prevention has to do with young people what to do with young people who are not smoking but who may be vaping. If vaping is a means to reduce the onset of smoking, then we need to see it in those terms rather than necessarily and solely see it as a negative activity. Thank you.